Uh, so next will be a paper delivered by John Holmes, uh, who is coming to us today from Franciscan University at Steubenville. And uh, John's uh, paper is a gleam came through the imagined world and the frame in Tolkien's art. So we give you now John Holmes. Ah, thank you. I swear that's not my dog. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, a gleam came through the imagined world and frame in Tolkien's art. I haven't timed this, so I'll try to uh, uh, keep it under time. In April of 1909, the second issue of the British Arts and Literature Journal, New Quarterly, appeared, containing a piece by a new voice in art criticism. The critic was landscape painter Roger Fry, a member of the Bloomsbury Group, who would soon be the number one influence in modernist art criticism, the theorist who had coined the term post-impressionist. Fry's simple title, An Essay in Aesthetics, was either very modest or very presumptuous. In fewer than 6,000 words, the essay attempted to express the purpose and function of art. In attempting to clarify the relationship between the images uh, in a work of representational art on the one hand, and on the other hand, images of things apprehended directly by the phenomenal world, and may I say, I find the word world quite phenomenal, phenomenal, I much prefer it to nothingness. In attempting to make this uh, clarification, Fry asks us to imagine someone looking at a street scene in a mirror. Fry's assertion is that on a purely behavioral level of responses to what we see, we are distanced from the images by the frame of the mirror, which sets off inside that frame an artificial world to which we don't belong. In the mirror, Fry claims, <clears throat> it is easier to abstract ourselves completely. The frame of the mirror then does to some extent turn the reflected scene from one that belongs to our actual life into one that belongs rather to the imaginative life. This is still uh, Fry talking. The frame of the mirror makes its surface into a very rudimentary work of art since it helps us to attain to the artistic vision. The work of art is intimately connected with the secondary imaginary, uh, imaginative life which all men live to a greater or less extent. The problem of what, this is me now, <clears throat> the problem of what Aristotle called mimesis, for which Fry's essay was attempting a 20th century solution, is compounded when we come to Tolkien's drawings. <clears throat> because in some of his visual work, his goal is to represent not what he calls in on fairy stories, the primary world, but an imaginary subcreated world that displays enough continuity with our primary world that we apprehend a sense of reality about it. Uh, and here I'll have to beg your indulgence because I neglected to um, attempt to get the, uh, uh, <clears throat> so I'm gonna check with Luke here and s make sure, uh, is, um, is my PowerPoint coming through or uh, uh, are we gonna have to do it from your end, Luke? Um, so if you are looking at Zoom on the bottom, if you'll click to share your screen. Ah, okay. So I, I was out of Zoom here. That's the, the, the first problem. Uh, okay, so share your screen. Screen share? is It's just called... Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. All right. Okay. And then you should be able to pick what you want to share. Okay. Um, it's probably easiest to just click the top left option where it says screen. Okay. If you just click that. Okay. Double click. Okay. And then, mm -hmm. okay. And it'll start opening up. And then if you just click to open up your PowerPoint full screen, just like you would normally do during a presentation. Um, is, is it showing there? Um, let's see. It is. So if you okay. just click from there beginning or from current slide. Right. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Very good. Okay. So, yeah. So I guess I'll be able to do it after all. Okay. Um, okay. So back to the, uh, uh, this the story. Fry's emphasis on the frame of the mirror, and by analogy the frame of the painting, has to do with a limiting effect on our perceptual mechanism. The image in the mirror is visionary in his sense of the term, in that we become true spectators, this is uh, Fry again, not selecting what we will see, but seeing everything equally. 
The frame is the boundary between our world and the visionary one, whether we call it fairy or Middle Earth. Of course, our Tolkien and shippy trained ears pick up at the word boundary, and we remember that bounders, that is rangers like Strider, haunted the boundaries, and that the ancient name for the region of England that Tolkien inhabited was Mircea, uh, Latinized to Mercia, and in the Lord of the Rings, modernized to the Rohiric name, the Mark. Each of those M words meant border. In this essay, we'll be looking at the frames and borders of certain paintings and sketches by Tolkien and their functions as liminal spaces, defining the interface of our world and the world in the painting. Fry, of course, was not the only modernist to treat problems of composition uh, psychologically. Ortega y Gasset in On Point of View in Arts treated the entire history of Western art in terms of the geometry of the artist's visual stance. In Distant Vision, he says, we do not fix the gaze on any point, but rather attempt to embrace the whole field, including its boundaries. For this re reason, we avoid focusing the eyes as much as possible. And, when, and then we are surprised to find that the object just perceived, our entire visual field, is concave. What he has in mind is you know, coming out from eyes, everything we see. The border or limit of a surface that tends to take the form of a hemisphere uh, uh, viewed from within. In this passage, Ortega y Gasset is dealing with uh, a quite different context, uh, the tension between detail and design, to which we will return in discussing Tolkien's Leaf by Nigel. But the connection between Tolkien's treatment of borders and his approach to fantasy should not be hard to see in the Spanish philosopher's terms. By treating the image on the canvas as an extension of our visual field, uh, the realist walks this far with the fantasist, that is, the painter treats the physical limits of the canvas as the playwright, or at least the dramaturge, uh, treats the physical limits of the stage. Tolkien uses precisely that language to relate the borders of a story to the frame of a painting in his posthumously published introduction to Smith of Wooten Major. The beginning and end of the story is to it, that is the story, uh, like the edges of the canvas or an added frame to a picture, say a landscape. It concentrates the teller's attention and yours on one small part of the country. But there are, of course, no real limits under the earth and in the sky above and in the remote and faintly glimpsed distances and in the unrevealed regions on either side. There are things that influence the very shape and color of the part that is pictured. With them, it would be quite different as they are really necessary to understanding what is seen. The essential difference between the portion of the subcreated world framed by the painting and the totality of that world, which has, of course, no real limits, as Tolkien says, forced itself startlingly on Nigel's consciousness in Tolkien's one piece of fiction, most vitally concerned with the problems of visual arts, Leaf by Nigel. Of Nigel's parish, the artist had glimpsed, as Tolkien's introduction had said, one small part of the country. In the climactic scene of the story, however, the transfigured Nigel rejoices in all of the unrevealed regions on either side. A very effective 21st century illustration of a Tolkien frame leading viewers uh, into Tolkien's world was staged in the highly successful exhibition of Tolkien's life and works, uh, Tolkien, Maker of Middle Earth, uh, from uh, June 1st to 20, the, October 28th, 2018 uh, at the Bodleian Library in Oxford and January 25th to May 12th, 2019 uh, at the Morgan Library in New York. The entire exhibit was framed by an entrance that provides a transitus from the viewer's primary world to Tolkien's Middle Earth. The viewer enters through the round door like a hobbit hole, which opens into a larger than life blow up of Tolkien's August 1937 watercolor, The Hill Hobbiton Across the Water. One must literally enter into Tolkien's vision to access the exhibit. The round door used by the designers of the Tolkien exhibit was fashioned, of course, from a familiar Tolkien pen and ink sketch, The Hall at Bag End, residence of B. Baggins Esquire, August 1937, which itself utilized the framing technique that Fry described. The round door is precisely concentric with the vanishing point of the composition and invites the eye to travel the road that goes ever on and on uh, outside of Bilbo's comfortable hole. The construction of the hole in Tolkien's illustration 
is a, more of an imaginative proje projection into the world of hobbits uh, than it may seem at first glance. For it requires some speculation as to what architectural skills uh, would be requisite to marry the sensibilities of a homey English cottage with a race of Middle Earth uh, burrowers. Despite Tolkien's contention in On Fairy Stories that fantasy is better matched to literary than visual art, Tolkien has out Naismith Naismith in posing and answering the simple realist's question, what would a hobbit hole look like if we could actually visit one? In honoring another principle from On Fairy Stories that fairy juxtaposes the rich and strange with the mundane, uh, Tolkien places in the ceiling of his hole a, that is ceiling is coextensive with uh, the walls, the floor joists that would be familiar to any cottage dweller in rural England, but the joists are curved and continue down the wall to become open studs, a ribbing to the structure which seems more natural to a shipwright than to the more rectilineal uh, housing contractor of the primary world. And yet, just as Tolkien argues that fairy story would certainly not all contain not only elven, elves and fays, but also tree and bird, water and stone, thick hardwood ribbing supporting vaulted ceilings can be found in the architecture of our primary world. The, the chapel of the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, demonstrates how the radiating arches can frame a door to another world for the faithful. The focal point of these ribs, of course, uh, is the altar, uh, but also the altar piece, uh, which in this case is uh, Eugenius uh, Kazimorowski's painting of the Divine Mercy Vision uh, received by Sister Faustina Kowalska in the 1930s. If you want your art to be seen, that's a good place to put it. The arches centering on an image of Mary was the format of uh, a lady chapel, the most famous uh, lady chapel being uh, the lady chapel of uh, Westminster Cathedral, uh, considered the mother church of English Catholicism. The ribs here are of stone rather than hardwood, but rounded ceilings would not have been foreign to Tolkien's architectural experience. Neither would the tension between the curved and the rectilinear that we see in Bilbo's parlor in Tolkien's sketch. Uh, the cl clear story window frames of Westminster curve to match the vault that they lead up to. Frames, after all, is what we are studying in this essay. And in Bilbo's parlor, uh, we see a similar phenomenon. The art he frames near his rounded front door, uh, or perhaps they are mirrors like Roger Fry's, they match the curves of Bilbo's vaulted ceilings. The frame on the left curves to match the concrete, uh, concave surface of the wall, but the one on the right is a flat planar surface that must be supported by a curved frame to be comfortable on the wall. And remember, a hobbit hole means something. Just as Fry's mirror frame mediates the phenomenal with the visionary, Bilbo's frames uh, media, mediate the flat and the curved. Just as Fry described with his mirror scenario, Bilbo's door frames a landscape of the real world into which Bilbo will be adventuring in the ensuing chapters. The sketch perpetuates one of the most, one of the fundamental illusions of Western art after Giotto, presenting the world of the painting as coextensive with the three-dimensional world of the viewer, making the surface of the canvas another border. The assumption that the figures on the canvas share the same world as the viewer would have been foreign to the medieval artist. The, uh, the design technique that exploits this modern concept of visual space is called foreshortening, an analog to what modernists in the theater used to call the fourth wall. The fourth wall alludes to 19th century realist box sets in proscenium theaters, and the plane of the proscenium corresponds to the plane of the canvas or supporting medium uh, in modern painting. Foreshortening, which treats the plane as an interface between uh, the world of the viewer and that depicted on the canvas in Fry's terms, real life uh, versus secondary life of imagination, provides the key effect in several of Tolkien's compositions. Uh, the convention of treating the plane of the support medium as, uh, that is canvas, uh, as an interface with the world of the beholder may already have been questioned as early as the French realists of the mid 19th century. And as Tolkien well knew, it was not an assumption of the medieval artist. 
Michael Fried describes an aesthetic assumption close to Fry's mirror analogy in Gustave Courbet's The Wounded Man, uh, 1844 to 1854, which in Fried's judgment calls into question what might be termed the ontological impermeability of the picture surface, or at least the impermeability of the bottom framing edge. So it's all about frames. Part of the power of viewing that painting derives from the fact that the implication of the wounded man's awkward position cut off at the waist by the bottom of the painting is that the man's legs would extend from the painting not downward past the bottom edge, but outward toward the beholder. The view through the portal effect of the 1937 Hobbit uh, illustration was anticipated uh, a quarter century earlier by Tolkien's pencil and pen ink sketch, The Back of Beyond. Uh, 1912. It may be that Tolkien intended to finish this sketch in ink after laying it out in pencil, but only the shutter doors and hinges of the portal receive an ink outline, while the rest remains in pencil. Smudges of ink across the paper offer one mute explanation for the interruption of the pen work. The picture was now spoiled. Also somewhat spoiled is the illusion of a third dimension as the smudges which in our accidental world take whatever shape they will, do not heed the ortho orthogonal lines of perspective drawing. The viewer must mentally erase the ink blots in order to perceive the cartoon's horizon lines. What we can do, however, is, uh, or when we do so, however, we can apprehend the beyond of the title. Uh, in Glorun sets off to seek Turin, September, 1927, the transgressive crossing of the margin as threshold is not inviting but threatening this time uh, and occurs in more than one dimension. The lower border of the painting, which Fried cited above, identifies as impermeable in Corbet's canvases, is also a geographic border for the parish of the Father of Dragons, Glorum. The water identified in the Book of Lost Tales only as the streams, but in unfinished tales as perhaps the, the river Narog, uh, constitutes a, a, a border both in the imaginative world and in the painting. In the stylized manner of this painting, the stream takes on more of the nature of a decorative element uh, than, the, uh, than of Hamlet's mirror held up to nature. Uh, it becomes a fairly straight ribbon of blue with only few suggestions of lighter or darker white ripple, ripples. The wavering streaks of yellow that mark the reflection of the dragon's uh, glowing body offer a notable variation. The simplicity of the river, however, is in keeping with the stylized nature of the rest of the composition. The mountains are simply varicolored triangles, uh, sun, a uh, white, and uh, you can't see that in this version, but I'll show you the sun a little bit later. Um, uh, the mountains are triangles, the sun, a white and dull rose flower of a grayish blue field, the trees, scoops of leaf color on a stem. And yet all these elements are put in the service of the foreshortening uh, that the focal figure of Glorund displays. The curve of local landscape is very slight, uh, but its apex, the point of the curve tangent with the line parallel uh, to the bottom margin, uh, is the cave from which Glorund is emerging. The color gradation aids in the foregrounding of Glorund as well, helping him to leap out of the painting. Background and uh, foreground are the darkest, blues, blacks, and grays, with Narog mostly deep blue, and a suggestion of black and gray rocks on the nearer shore, which is another border. Shining out from the, this ground is the golden glow of what the tale of the children of Horan calls the golden worm. It is not the friendly glow of the hearth, however, uh, though the green face that projects from the golden body of Lorand is cartoonish and mask-like. The coloring of the farther shore records the destructiveness of the dragon's glow, the row of trees forming another border, uh, that the worm's body bisects is progressively withered the closer it gets to Gloran. Uh, the color gradient aids this effect. To Gloran's left, the farthest tree is mostly green with one ochre section fa facing the dragon. The next closest tree is half ochre uh, but retains its foliated shape. The one after that is a bare stem uh, with branches, its leaves all presumably fallen ash. 
last closest to the drake only stumps remain. This gradient lifts Glorand out of the picture in a way that augments the foreshortening of his figure, breaking both the plane of the canvas and the border of the picture. The monstrous forelimbs reach out towards us like the pointing figure in uh, Alfred Leet's Lord Kitchener Wants You poster that Tolkien could not have escaped seeing in 1914. Glorand's uh, uncomfortable looking pose, uh, Hammond and Skull call it awkwardly foreshortened, with the forelimbs larger than those of any Tolkien dragon, uh, matches Tolkien's description of the dragon's attack in the Children of Hurin, ready to spring over the chasm with his great forelegs and then draw his bulk after. Lauren's trespass is not uh, only into the third dimension toward the viewer, uh, but over the edge of the painting into the white margin, displacing even the caption, I guess you can't see it in this version, which is from its syntax. Um, I'll skip over that. The effect of the flame is conveyed by the shades of color. Uh, I also cut that off in this picture. Uh, is, however, surprisingly tempered by Tolkien's muted uh, palette. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll skip over that point too, but just skip to the point about the sun, uh, which includes that here the white is not all one shade, but there's some modeling. Uh, in light gray, uh, which is perceptibly a face. Uh, though it must be conceded that the effect of the dragon bursting off the canvas is dampened by the limits of Tolkien's draftsmanship on the figure of the dragon itself. Uh, the effect is manifestly a, a, a prime intent of the composition and that Tolkien has achieved what a Freed would term a ontologically permeable uh, border. Okay, um, the general theme of borders suggests uh, one of the fundamental differences between the professional artist and the amateur uh, asserted by art critics. The relative brevity of the compositional uh, period uh, of the amateur in terms of matching the composition to the space or the support medium. Uh, even Tolkien's Niggle has an amateur's ta take on the problem because his vision keeps proving too much uh, proving too much for the border of his canvas, and he keeps needing to add other sheets uh, to the edges of his painting. Uh, this uh, follows exactly Niggle's uh, situation in Leap by Niggle, but it also follows uh, the situation that we saw this morning with Eric's uh, uh, map with all of the uh, additions uh, pasted on. Uh, my favorite Tolkien illustration of this problem is his earliest Middle Earth map, well, it's actually uh, shown here, whatever this is, uh, uh, drawn on lined and margin graph paper on the upper left corner of which the pre-printed legend, do not write on this margin, is blissfully ignored. The compositional problem of the irresistible force of fantasy bursting through the frame of the picture provides the central conflict of leaf by Nigel. Nigel fits his composition onto the canvas, but then that space proves inadequate. Blaming Nagel for insufficient planning doesn't seem quite fair, does it? Uh, though blame for insufficient planning of his journey is all we hear from the Kafka-esque uh, authority figures in Leaf by Nagel. And yet coloring outside of the lines, drawing beyond the warning, do not write in this margin, is not altogether an aesthetic flaw or an amateur's mistake. The one arena in which Tolkien lost his amateur status as a visual artist was book illustration and cover design. With the publication of The Hobbit in 1937, Tolkien became a professional book illustrator. His designs for The Hobbit were by no means his first experience with mechanical reproduction of his artwork. His program for the November 19th, 1913 Exeter College Smoker includes a pen and ink sketch of Curl Street in Oxford, where Tolkien's rooms were at Exeter. Copied from a sketch that he apparently made from his window, uh, in 1913, I just lost my place. Um, the spire of All Saints Church forms the left-hand border, which Tolkien merciless, mercilessly cuts off with one notable exception. The street light that illuminates the four inebriated smokers is clamped to the margin line, uh, as if the margin were the light, the light pole itself. Part of the scrolled ironwork holding the lamp breaks into the liminal area of the margin as if it were breaking into our world. Uh, 
The imaginative assumption of such eye limiting borders is that the world of the picture continues beyond the border. Um, just as Shakespeare suggests the Battle of Agincourt in uh, Henry V, by simply having a handful of soldiers from each side dashing on and off stage, gesturing off stage, etc. Um, Nagel's epiphany at the end of Leaf by Nagel captures the experience of slipping beyond the borders and seeing the beauties we already always knew were there. Uh, I'm not sure how much time I've got left, but let's look at uh, uh, Tolkien doing the same thing of what I was talking about with his uh, book design. Uh, on the bottom there, uh, we we see the, the symmetrical dragons. Am I out of time? Um, you have about a minute. You have about yeah. Okay, I'll I'll I'll, I'll wrap it up here then. Uh, so you, we see the dragon uh, there as placeholders. He's uh, kind of uh, mimicking uh, the borders, but at the top, um, uh, this is uh, it, this uses the uh, the principle of uh, a bleed. Uh, and and this was uh, this was my point that Tolkien in um, you know understood enough about book design uh, to know that uh, with with the bleed. Um, you intentionally imply an infinity by uh, running things right to the margin so you don't get that uh, a cutoff line. And so you, you have to produce more uh, uh, artwork uh, because then it gets trimmed by the, uh, for, uh, uh, for book publication. And so uh, the bleed is uh, the, it shows the uh, uh, overcoming of the limits of border. Oh, and, and I know, uh, the, the, uh, significance of my uh, uh, of my title is um, is not seen um, without the the uh, the ending. Uh, it comes from uh, Tolkien talking about the, the gleam coming through uh, in um, on fairy stories. Uh, he's talking about uh, uh, you catastrophe when it breaks through. In such stories, when a sudden turn comes, we get a piercing glimmer of joy and heart desire for a moment passes outside the frame, rends indeed the very web of story and lets a gleam. So that's, that's the importance of it, the significance of it. Thank you, thank you, John. Thank you so much.